sides. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is JC Ripperger, and I'm the marketing coordinator here at ISAC. Uh, today, we are happy to welcome Matt Ring and Roberta Eckert with Nationwide Retirement Services, who will be presenting on Nationwide Tax Efficient Retirement Income Program. Before we go ahead and get started, I will mention that we will leave time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please leave any questions you have in the chat box and we will address them once the presentation is finished. Now I will go ahead and pass it off to Matt and Roberta. Thank you both. Thanks, JC. And good afternoon, everybody. This is Matt Ring, uh, formerly retirement specialist here in Iowa. I'm sure I've met or spoken with most of you in the past. Um, some updates, I have moved on to a new position and Nationwide is in the process of uh, hiring and um, inserting a new retirement specialist into the field uh, to be able to be visit with you locally here hopefully by the end of the year as we come out of the pandemic. Um, and at the end of the presentation today, we'll provide some contact information for our retirement resources group. That way, if you have any questions, you know who you can call. Without further ado, uh, allow me to hand the mic over to Roberta Eckert, today's presenter. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and in fact, I will be working with Matt uh, in his new role. So that's great that we are not going to have to um, work together anymore. So thanks so much for joining us, especially as you start winding towards a long holiday weekend uh, to learn a little bit about managing the taxes on your retirement income. And that's something a lot of people don't always think so much about when they are planning for retirement or saving for retirement. You know, we um, contribute to a 457 plan and we um, save personally maybe in some personal savings accounts and we are squirreling away money and clipping coupons and all this kind of stuff to save money but when you get that uh, nest egg built up people don't always really think very carefully about taking it out in a tax effective manner so i want you to start thinking about this it was said to me about two years ago and i thought it was a very good metaphor for what we're doing someone once said to me you no longer have a nest egg and i said what do you mean i no longer have a nest egg i most certainly do i've got my retirement account right here you can see the statement why are you saying it's not my nest egg they said really what you have is a carton of eggs and what you need to be thinking about once you're retired is what egg are you going to crack first in order to make sure that your portfolio or your retirement income assets last as long as they possibly can? And I thought that was a great way of looking at what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I work for a group of the Nationwide Retirement Institute, and I'll tell a little bit about what that is in just a moment. But I do want to let you know that for today's presentation, as any presentations that we deliver to you through the Retirement Institute. It is educational only. We're here to provide you through our eight different presentations as much education as we possibly can so that no stone goes unturned when it comes to contemplating all of the factors that come into your retirement and your retirement income. So what that means through all this fine print is that I'm not going to be giving you any tax advice Although we are gonna talk about some tax ideas, I'm not going to be giving you advice. I am not gonna be giving you legal advice or investment advice. Everything we're gonna talk about today, again, is educational. Now, before we get to today's agenda, I'll tell you a little bit about the group I work for, and it's called the Nationwide Retirement Institute. We are the thought leaders of Nationwide, which is a term that means we create a lot of content based on um, interviews and surveys and polls that we do with people to ask them and find out, <coughs> pardon me, what's really on their mind when it comes to their retirement. And consequently, we have created presentations around social security claiming, around tax or health care costs once you are retired. We have a presentation that dives very deep into Medicare. Um, and several others. And today is the one called Tax Efficient Retirement Income. And our agenda is going to be threefold. First, we're going to tell you about some tax basics, um, as well as clearing up some mis misconceptions that people have about how the tax code works. 
then we're going to look at why it's super important to set up retirement income sources as soon as you can. This is a not wait till retirement task. Set up diverse retirement income sources as soon as possible. We'll explain what those are and why that's important. And then finally, what are the next steps? What are some other things you can do once we're done with our conversation today? And um, what are what are some of the thoughts that uh, you might want to carry to your financial advisor or to uh, the person that does your taxes? So first of all, let's kind of do a little review and a little updating on tax basics, because since the tax cuts and I'm sorry, the tax cuts and jobs creation act from a couple of years ago, some things have changed. So first of all, let's start from square one and realize that not all taxes are alike. There are two different kinds of taxes on income. Excuse me, I had a frog in my throat there. <clears throat> and it depends upon the income that you're receiving as to how it's going to be taxed. So first of all, any of your wages, um, overtime, um, your regular wages, any kind of um, bonuses that you get would be subject to ordinary income tax. Certain retirement accounts, um, not your 457, well, I'm sorry, your 457 plan, your IRA, a 401k. Once you take money out of those accounts, you would pay ordinary income tax on them. Uh, and we'll talk more about these accounts in about five or 10 minutes. Interest that you earn on a bank account, that could be a savings account, a money market account, a certificate of deposit. And what a lot of people don't realize is. Social Security income in part. That means that part, but not all, of your Social Security income is taxed. So the logical question is, well, that means that part isn't taxed, right? And the answer is, right. 15% or 15%, not 50, 15% of your Social Security check is tax-free. Then there's another kind of tax called a capital gains tax. And this is a tax that you would pay on selling investments, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, things of that nature. And with some exclusions, profit from selling some real estate. So let's kind of work through this a little bit more and uh, scrutinize the ordinary income tax bracket with in 2021. With the uh, Tax Cuts and Job Creation Act, that actually added another bracket into the tax code. And this is what it looks like this year. Now, this again is ordinary income. This is what you would pay on a distribution from your uh, IRA, um, your wages, your overtime, your bonuses, um, things in your bank account and so forth. So it is also known as a tiered system. And in fact, you will hear a lot of people marching around saying, well, I'm in the 24% tax bracket or I'm in the 22% tax bracket. And that's really somewhat misleading. So let me walk you through what this is saying. What this is saying, first of all, on the left hand side, one thing that the Tax Cuts and Job Creation Act did was increase the amount of a standard deduction. Um, so you can claim a standard deduction on your taxes, or if you itemize your deductions and that ends up with a larger number, you could do that instead. But if you are married filing jointly and you are 65 years old or older, your standard deduction is now $27,800. So we'll put this together a little bit. You're married filing jointly, and on the first $19,900 of taxable income, you would pay 10%. So what that really means is that if you're married filing jointly and you are over um, 65 years old, then you're really not paying taxes on any amount until you have um, you have earned, I guess, $27,801, because that $27,800, which is your standard deduction, is offset by any tax. So in other words, or any income you have to the tune of $27,800 is offset by the standard deduction. And what that means is that it washes, and it's almost like 
that first $27,800 has a 0% tax bracket. And that's what I meant when I said you will pay 10% on the dollars that start at $27,801. So if you go up to $19,900 of taxable income, again, understanding that this first 27,800 is sort of a, a um, gimme or a wash, then you would pay 10% on that amount. So, your, so that's something else you want to be thinking about is that your income isn't necessarily everything that you're going to be taxed on. And in fact, if you're looking at this 20, 20, whoops, $27,800 that's your standard deduction, and you add the $19,900, which you are taxed at 10% on, now you're at $47,700, and you are still, you still only paid 10% on 20,000 of it. So hopefully I didn't belabor that point too much. The next bracket, as you can see, I'm still in the married filing jointly, goes from 19,901 to 81,050. And then you can see it jumps pretty much, it jumps, $22,000. That's almost a 10% leap. And the tax bracket at 22% is almost twice what the 12% is. And then there's a 24% bracket, 32, 35, and so forth. So when people say, I'm in the 22% bracket, it does not necessarily mean that they are have earned uh, 172750 because only a certain amount is taxed at 22 percent think of it as a bunch of buckets once you fill up the bucket married filing jointly with twenty seven thousand eight hundred dollars that bucket has a zero painted on it the next bucket nineteen thousand nine hundred dollars or a total remember of forty seven thousand four hundred dollars and once you filled up that ten percent bucket with nineteen thousand nine hundred dollars then you select the next bucket and that next bucket is twelve percent and you'd pay 12% only on the amount of 19, between 19,901 and 81,050 and so forth. So even though you might have the last bit of your income in that 24% tax bracket does not mean that you're paying 24% on every dollar back to dollar one. For single people, the brackets are a little bit different. You're, I mean, sorry, the brackets are, are not different, but the amount of income that's assigned to each bracket is different, of course, because you're working with one person instead of two. And this time, the single person, age 65 years old or older, has a standard deduction of 14250 so the first 14250 has a zero tax attached to it because you're going to match $14,250 um, of taxable income with the standard deduction. They zero each other out, and then you would pay 10% on the amount over that up to $99.50 and so forth down the line. So we're going to do a little math problem here and talk about the effective tax rate versus the marginal tax rate. So for someone with taxable income, a single person, of taxable income of $150,000, which really is income in the door of uh, $150,000 plus $14,250, because remember that's standard deduction. So really they've got an income of $164,250. So that first $14,250 is zero. The next $9,950 is taxed at 10% for a total of $995. The next um, amount between $99.51 and $45.25 is taxed at 12% for a total of $36.69 and so on down the road. So the total tax for this person is $26,601 divided by their taxable income, not their total income, and their effective tax rate is more like 17.7% not 24, which is where that last level or band of income was taxed. So that's all the good news. And as we start thinking about that, what we wanna also start to consider is how can we make our income more tax effective? I'm gonna go back a couple of slides here so that if at all possible, if we're married filing jointly, we can keep our income level maybe in that, um, 
12% tax bracket. And for a married couple filing jointly, whoops, hang on one second, I had a technology goof here. Let me fix this. Okay, got it. Thank you very much for your patience there. So for a married couple filing jointly, if they can keep their taxable income at 81,050 or below, then they're in a pretty good they're in a pretty good tax situation. But remember that 81,050 is not the total amount of incomes that's coming in. Once you add all that standard deduction, it's more like $108,850. Okay, so moving on, um, when you start to look at what you could be doing right now in order to engineer your taxes as best you can in retirement, um, there are three buckets. These are different buckets than your taxable buckets, of course, but three buckets that you want to be putting money into so that you can pick and choose where your money's coming from when it comes time for you to retire. A taxable bucket, a tax deferred bucket, and a tax-free bucket. And you might be saying to yourselves, well, wait a minute, why don't I just put all my money in a tax-free bucket? Because of a few different things, not the least of which is you don't wanna put all of your eggs in one basket, whether it is investments, whether it's tax buckets or anything else. And you'll see what I mean by that in just a few minutes. Likewise, you don't, or likewise, you might be asking, why do I even need a taxable bucket if my objective is to save money on taxes? And you'll see what that looks like in just a couple of minutes as well. So when you're looking at retirement income, we are going to look at the type of tax paid depending upon where that income is coming from. If you have, and these uh, investments are not held in an IRA or 457. But if you've got income coming from the sale of investments, or if you have income coming in from um, earnings like dividends or interest from stocks and bonds, then you're either going to pay capital gains tax or ordinary income tax. And we'll look at what those tax rates look like in just a couple of minutes. The taxable portion of your Social Security income, as I indicated a little earlier, is going to be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. And that is the tax brackets that we looked at just a couple of moments ago. And then if you sell real estate, and I'm thinking about your home, for example, then the gain on that real estate sale might be subject to capital gains under certain circumstances. And you can see in my footnote down at the bottom there that there is um, some exceptions. So for example, um, capital gains are exempt on the sale of a primary residence up to $500,000 if you are married filing jointly, provided you meet some living in the house requirements. So, so given that, um, when you've got retirement income coming in, what about the taxes? How can I be thinking about my retirement income from that tax perspective, um, as opposed to uh, just assuming everything is going to be taxed at my tax brackets that we looked at just a few minutes ago? And one of those things or one of those answers is understanding how capital gains tax works. So this is why you might want to keep some of your investments in a taxable account, because the short version to this slide is capital gains taxes, especially long-term capital gains taxes, have a far more preferable tax rate than the income tax brackets that we looked at just a few minutes ago. But first, let's understand what capital gains are. Pretty easy, it's the difference between what you paid for something and what you sold it for, if there's been a gain. So if I purchased 100 shares of stock for $1,000 and I sold them those shares of stock for $2,000, well then I have a one, uh, sorry, I have a $1,000 capital gain. The next uh, test that we want to look at to determine taxes is did I hold that investment for one year or less or more than one year? If I hold the investment, those 100 shares of stock for seven months and then sell those shares of stock, then I'm going to pay ordinary income tax on that gain. Those were the brackets we looked at a few minutes ago. However, 
if I hold on to this investment for more than a year, say 14 months, then that capital gain is considered a long-term capital gain and it's going to be taxed depending upon how much money you make. So let's imagine that you and your spouse are married and you're filing your tax return jointly. If you make between and have a ta let's put it this way, if you have a taxable income of say $400,000, then you would have a ta capital gains tax assessed to the sale of your property at 15%. And remember, when we looked at some of those tax brackets, you were looking at 22%, 24%, and so forth. And uh, if you look at um, income in the $500,000 level, I can assure you, you are um, north of the 24% tax bracket for a certain band of that money. But here's where a lot of people get a little uh, turned around, and I want to make sure you're aware of this. Let's imagine I'm making $450,000. No, let's not do that. Let's say I'm making $400,000. I'm stretching it big to make my point here. I make $400,000, and I have an asset that I've held for two years, and I sell it, and I have a $200,000 gain. Well, you would automatically think that if I've got an income of $400,000, that I would pay 15% on that $200,000 gain. It doesn't work that way. That $200,000 gain is added to my income. Now, my taxable income is not $400,000, it's $600,000. And consequently, I would pay 20% on that $200,000 gain, not 15%. So you want to be aware of that, but for many, many people, they would end up paying only 15% cat long-term capital gains rate on any assets that they sold um, for, that they held for one year, or sorry, for more than one year. So moving on um, and talking more about some tax deferred sources of retirement. So I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. Let me go back for just a moment. So this is one reason why you would want to have some of your money, especially if you expect to be holding assets for maybe um, a year or longer, but not really long. You might want to think about setting up an account so that those assets are taxed at long-term capital gains rates as opposed to ordinary income tax rates. The other question then becomes, well, what about my... Uh, 457 plan, my 401k, my IRA. Look at that for just a moment and we'll make some kind of um, comparison. First of all, there are also um, tax deferred sources of retirement income. And this is where you uh, contribute money to these types of accounts. You don't pay current income tax on those contributions. Well, the money is potentially growing and compounding um, in that those accounts, you don't pay current income tax. And then it's only when you take money out of the account that you would pay ordinary income tax on, um, on that amount. So let's go back to my 100 shares of stock that I paid $1,000 for. Well, if I was holding that in my IRA and then I sold that, uh, those 100 shares of stock and realized $2,000 for that, meaning a $1,000 gain. Well, when I take that $1,000 gain out of my IRA, it's not taxed at long-term capital gains rates. It's taxed at ordinary income tax rate. And the tax that's assessed on that $1,000 is a direct function of all my other income based on the brackets that we looked at when we first got started. And that's why if I'm intending on doing some trading or buying and selling, I might want to consider keeping those types of investments in the taxable bracket versus my IRA, for example. Um, next, annuities. If you're familiar with annuities, uh, when you take money out of the annuity or when those um, income streams are paid to you, they are taxed at ordinary income tax. And so these are great accounts because the benefit is that while the account is growing and compounding, especially over a certain period of time, if you can let it sit there, then the idea is that it's grown and compounded and money that you did not have to stop and take money out of in order to pay current income tax stays there and it grows and compounds as well. And the idea behind setting up 
retirement accounts such as these is that at some date in the future, um, you when you retire, you might be in a lower income tax bracket. And therefore, even though you're paying ordinary income tax, you've had the uh, time on your side of compounding and so forth, and then you pay it at um, a potentially lower tax bracket. And so that's why tax deferred sources are also really important. But in my opinion, one of the best ways of getting retirement income, although there aren't a ton of choices, is tax-free. And so you can receive tax-free income from municipal bonds, certain kinds. You can receive tax-free income from retirement savings if they are a Roth. So a Roth 457, a Roth 401k, a Roth IRA, there is no tax on distributions from a Roth. Uh, health reimbursement and health savings accounts. If you take money out of your health savings account in order to pay for qualified medical expenses, then you do not pay taxes on the health savings account. In fact, health savings accounts are very, very popular in saving for retirement because you can put money into a health savings account and the contribution you make is tax-free. Well, the account is growing and compounding provided you've been investing in uh, certain types of um, choices that are not unlike the choices you have in your 457 plan, then the compounding and growth is also on a tax-free basis. And then when you take money out, provided you're paying or provided you're using it for qualified medical expenses, no matter how old you are, then you take it out tax-free as well. Now, you would think, that if that's the case, you would shovel as much money as you possibly can into a health savings account, but you can't do that. There are limits to how much you can contribute. And moreover, you can only contribute to a health savings account if you are covered by a high deductible health plan. Next, a uh, non-taxable portion of social security income, 15% of every social security check you get tax-free, you don't pay any tax on it. And then the cash value of your life insurance plan, you can tap into that and you're not paying any taxes there as well. So you can see that there are certain uh, vehicles that you could utilize to generate tax-free sources of retirement income, but the list isn't huge. And that's why you wanna consider the benefits of tax-deferred investing um, as well as taxable. One other thing that we want to make sure you're aware of, as long as we're talking about Social Security, are some considerations for private and public sector workers. And uh, we work with a lot of um, public safety individuals. And if that's your situation or you are married to someone who's worked in the public safety realm, that would be generally speaking fire and police, then there might be some considerations centered around something called a government pension offset or uh, I should say and or a windfall elimination provision. And so this has to do with how much social security you would receive dependent upon two boxes that you check. Number one, did you pay into social security? And the second box is for a job in which you will receive a pension. So let me rephrase that. If I did not pay into social security or the system for work I did for which I will get a pension, then um, I might be subject to something called the windfall elimination provision. And that applies if I am going to, at some point later or some point prior in my career, I also worked in the private sector. And so let's look at this, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back for just a moment. So that's something where um, our retirement specialists can help walk you through. We've got a paper on it that you can read, uh, but do know that if you worked and had experience working both in the public and the private sector, your social security benefits could be, um, could be altered because of that particular work. Second, what about your spouse? Would your spouse um, collect or sorry, would your spouse collect social security benefits? What if they themselves worked in the um, public sector? How does it work for social security benefits? And so there are some considerations for social for um, private and public sector workers. But again, 
primarily working or primarily dealing with um, public safety or fire and police. But do know that there are ways in, or things that might affect your social security income dependent upon, did you pay into social security, yes or no? And then second of all, did, are you receiving a pension or are you expected to receive a pension for the work um, that you did where you were not paying into social security? So a little more involved than our, uh, beyond the scope of today. But at that point, once you're getting social security, not all of it is taxed, as I've mentioned a few moments ago. And so what about the amount that is taxed? We know that 15% is tax free. But how is the Social Security income taxed? It's, there's actually a calculation that is a little different than just lumping it in with all of your other taxable income. So what they're going to do is they're going to take your income from all the other sources, not Social Security. So if I have income from dividends and interest and a pension, that's going to be added up. They're then going to add in any tax-exempt interest income. I'm not going to pay taxes on that income, but it's there just for the purposes of the calculation. Then they're also going to add in excluded foreign income. That's kind of rare. And then they're going to add in 50% of your Social Security benefits. So once they mash all that together, they're coming up with something called provisional income, and that's what you would be taxed on. So don't think that all of your Social Security benefit minus 15% uh, would be thrown at those brackets we looked at a little earlier. Uh, there is a calculation um, that determines what the tax would be. Now let's go back to those three brackets for a couple of moments. And when we're, if you recall, you had a taxable bucket. And that was, uh, this is by the way, a slide we saw a little while ago. You've got the taxable investments, that's your stocks, most bonds and CDs. And that's money that when you're ready to take money out of the account, you've been paying taxes on that year over year. So when you go to take it out of the account, it's not like you're going to be hit with this great big tax bill because you've been sheltering the income uh, from taxes all these years. You're kind of paying as you're going as you've been going. Um, taxable portion of social security benefits, I've mentioned a few times, and then the profit from selling a primary home with those exclusions that we mentioned to you a short time ago. Tax deferred, again, a pension, retirement savings, the 401k, 403b, 457, your IRA and certain annuities, and then there are your tax-free buckets. So that was served as a reminder. We saw that slide a little earlier. And what we're going to do is share with you a couple of slides that show this particular strategy in action. And what we have here are two different couples. And this year, what they're going to do is decide that they're going to go on a trip. They're going to take their grandkids to the Grand Canyon. And they decide that that trip's going to cost them $10,000. But before they do that, they want to make sure their home is protected. They've got a, a couple of issues going on. They want to make sure there's no uh, problem when they're away. So they realize or determine that they need about $10,000 for home renovations. It's one-time expense. So basically, what they need is $20,000 on top of the usual $100,000 retirement income that they've been taking in prior years. So each couple takes out their $100,000 of retirement income each year, the 20 in extras. So each of them needs $120,000. Couple one is going to take that extra $20,000 out of the same account as they've been taking the $100,000 of their retirement income, which is their tax deferred, it says 401k, let's call it the 457. Now, after that standard deduction of $27,800, they will be taxed on $92,200. The first um, 19,900 of that is taxed at 10% for a total of 1990. The next 61,150 taxed at 12, and the next 11,180 taxed at 22. So the total tax they pay is 11,700 and $81. Couple two 
listen to this webinar and they are uh, well versed in the benefits of and advantages of tax diversification. So what they did was they took that same $100,000 out of their retirement account that they've been taking year over year. But this time, what they're going to do is they're going to take $10,000 out of their Roth. That's what they're going to use for the home, sorry, that's what they're going to um, use for the vacation, sorry about that. The next $10,000 is going to also come from the Roth and that's what they're going to pay for the renovations. There's no limit as to how much you can take out of your Roth, uh, although the amount you do take out of the Roth is tax free. So they're taking $100,000 out of their tax deferred account, which they've been doing year over year, and $72,200 is going to be taxed because remember, I've said it about six times already, they've got that standard deduction. This time, and I won't go through the, the whole math calculation, but this time they're going to pay $8,266 on tax. Bottom line, couple two, who exercised tax diversity is going to pay 30, sorry, $3,515 less in tax than couple number one did. And that's one of the beauties of diverse retirement income sources. But there's another one that's not a tax per se, but it is something that you would want to scrutinize. And that's what happens when you're on Medicare. When you're on Medicare, and in fact, this slide's um, a year outdated, but the concept's still exactly the same. When you are on Medicare, you will pay premiums for your Part B coverage. Your Part B is your medical coverage. And there is a two-year look back. So let's pretend it's 2020 right now. And what that means is that they're going to look back two years to determine what your income was in order to figure out how much to charge you for your Part B premiums this year. So what that means is that if someone is married filing jointly and their taxable income, that's the amount in excess of that standard deduction, was $174,000 or less, then each of them would pay $144.60 for their Part B premium or their medical coverage. For their Part D or drug coverage, they would simply pay the premium and therefore there would be no extra surcharges that they would pay for that specific income level. Now, let's imagine that each, or let's imagine then that this couple is not making $174,000 in taxable income, but they are making 174,000, let's say 175,000. What that means now is that they are bumped into the next bracket regarding their um, Part B premium and their Part D, and they're going to pay a surcharge. So they're going to pay each another 5780 for Part B premiums. That's on top of the 14460. They're also going to pay another $12.20 uh, each. This, by the way, is on a monthly basis for their Part D or prescription drug plan, and that's over the plan premium. So what that means is that this married couple every month is going to pay another $70 in excess premiums for their Medicare coverage. So if you think about that and look at this a little more carefully, that means that that one extra dollar in taxable income now just pop them into the next bracket and they're going to be paying $70 per person per month for the exact same coverage that they would re receive it, be receiving if they had an income of 174,000. So put another way, another dollar of taxable income means that they'd be paying about another $1,700 in surcharges for the exact same coverage. So what if, instead of taking all that money out of their taxable accounts, what if they took say 174,000 out of their taxable accounts and then anything else that they need for living expenses, they took either out of their Roth, which is tax-free, 
a health savings account, which is tax free, or any other tax free resource that's available to them. And that, although it, those surcharges are not considered a tax, it is something that year over year could add up and could be expensive and is another way in which you can manage, um, manage your tax diversification a little better to avoid. So having diverse accounts might allow you to stay in that lower tax bracket. Remember, at a total income of $108,800, um, you are staying in that 10 and 12% bracket. And then um, any other income that's coming in from municipal bonds or the 15% that comes from social security, that's tax free. So it is conceivable that you have an income income of 108,000 or more, provided that some of that excess is coming from tax free accounts and still only pay a maximum of 12% on that band of income. So as we're thinking about what we can do next, I've got a couple of ideas for you. First of all, I have a questionnaire that I can provide to you that you can either bring to your accountant or your financial advisor. Um, that's about 10 different questions to ask about um, managing your taxes, even well in advance of the time you retire. Um, also, the retirement specialists that work with um, oh, yeah, a high, yeah, I'm, I'm mixing my states together with Iowa Association of Counties. Um, that's also something where you could lean on us at Nationwide to investigate and look at some of the different tools, um, an interactive retirement planner, for example, that we can put in place or um, um, demonstrate in order to show you how. Um, how all of this works in in real life so those are just a couple of thoughts for you we also have a copy of this slide deck that we can send to you if you like um, hopefully i should have said that before you started taking furious scribbly notes but we can send you um, pictures of the slides as well so with that i've got about 10 or 15 minutes or so um, left uh, i would also tell you where else you might be able to go from your own perspective in addition to utilizing some nationwide sources and that's your own retirement plan liaison um, and i mentioned a retirement specialist and a tax advisor so for the couple minutes i have left i'm going to see what kind of questions you have but i'm going to give you a couple of next steps and one next step is understand how your current retirement savings and your social security benefits are going to be taxed as well as any pension you might have if you have a 401, um, sorry, a Roth 401k or a 457 within your account, um, you could be creating some tax-free income in retirement. But I think the important, uh, important takeaway in addition to these is also work with an expert now to get advice on anything that you're going to be thinking about um, investing in in the future and where is the best spot to keep that investment. Is it in a taxable account to purchase it in your IRA and then keep working with that um, expert so that you could strategize withdrawals and minimize your taxes. So I'm gonna go back, uh, whoops, stay there. And I'm going to turn it back over to Matt and JC and see if you have any questions that we can help you out with. Hi, Roberta. I'm not seeing any questions right now, um, but if anyone does have any questions, feel free to send them to ISAC and we can send them along or send them to Nationwide as well. Excellent. Um, Matt, uh, I'm going to throw it to you to see what kinds of additional thoughts or comments you'd like to make, um, especially within the context of today's program. Yeah, thanks, Roberta, and a great job as always. Um, just as a follow-up for anybody who might have some questions after the call, after the uh, webinar today, you can call our Retirement Resources Group, um, and that team has a team of retirement specialists such as myself. They're available over the phone Monday through Friday, and we also have a handful of personal retirement counselors who are certified financial planners or CFPs. Um, and they can assist with anything from an account review of your deferred comp plan through NACO or some more of the higher level questions that maybe came up during Roberta's presentation today surrounding your Social Security, Medicare, taxes, et cetera. Um, and the phone number that you can call toll free for the Retirement Resources Group is 1 
888-401-5272. So again, 1-888-401-5272. And if you're wondering whether or not your county offers Roth 457, you can check with your auditor's office or payroll, um, and they can get in touch with Nationwide if you'd like to have that added to the plan. A lot of times it comes down to payroll functions or payroll slots depending on if the county would have any additional uh, slots available for payroll withholdings. Um, the software that's being used for payroll may or may not be able to withhold money after taxes. So those are some of the common, I think, let's say speed bumps that could potentially allow or inhibit the Roth plan to be added. Um, but it is a great benefit. Again, as Roberta mentioned, you can pay your taxes now and then it's tax-free income and retirement. So. Thanks for your attention today. Um, before we sign off, we can just double check with the ISAC team if there are any questions that come up in the chat in the meantime. They were not. All righty. Matt, I'm going to barge in. I know, I know we're trying to wrap up, but there was one thought I wanted to comment on, and I'm so glad you brought out the accessibility to the certified financial planners. These people are available to you at no cost. And if you went to meet with a, fina a certified financial planner in your community or town, uh, more than likely you would pay a fee understandably they've got to make a living too in order to consult with them so this is a wonderful benefit um, they are adhered to uh, strict standards of ethics and um, all kinds of um, fiduciary responsibility um, rules that um, our industry requires so if that's of interest to you do take advantage of that because that's a great benefit uh, that is provided to you through we nationwide folks and we did yep. actually have one question come up. Uh, sorry, I cut you off. You can finish what you were going to say. I'm finished. I knew if I blabbed on long enough, someone would ask something. <laughs> um, it says, does the resale only apply after 65 as capital gain? I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure what somebody means by resale. R-E. Is that a... a yeah, uh, this, are they referring to a home? Real estate sale, they said. Ah, okay, oh, RE sale, I get it, real estate sale. So no, if you if you have lived in a home for, and, and this is how I am understanding the tax code, I am not a tax accountant, so you'd wanna double check, fact check me. But if you have owned a home, say your primary residence, you have lived in it for um, two out of the past five years, and then you sell it. If you are married filing jointly, then $500,000 of that gain is exempt from capital gain. So if I bought a house for $200,000 and sold it for $400,000, that $200,000 gain would be exempt from to any tax provided I lived in it for two out of the five years. Now, on the other hand, if I owned a undeveloped lot or a piece of property and I um, bought it for $100,000 and sold it for $200,000, then depending upon how long I held it for, that would determine um, the tax on that gain. But again, um, everybody's situation is different. You might want to double check that, but that is something um, that um, that's the general rule. Thank you. And I don't see any others at the moment. Okay, well, you guys Thanks, have a everybody. wonderful, wonderful long weekend. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present to you all and look forward to doing a presentation for you again in the hopefully not too distant future. Thanks, Roberta. Thanks, Thank JC and ISAC team. Thanks, Katie.